just when you come up our stairs, then it flops off to the right. So the guy, the, the gunman actually just came around with the, the submachine gun and just spread the bullets. So he didn't carry, he was just he was out to get where it was there, and, and that was it. Now, um, this, this killing was in September of 1988. Yeah. Uh, there was an inquiry, um, a review rather, by a judge, Desmond De Silva, into the murder mm -hmm. of Pat Finucane. They didn't yes. get a full inquiry. They got a review. And when the report of that review was published, your father, his killing and the killers of your father, it uh, formed a whole chapter in that report. Could you tell us about the links between your father's killing and the killing of Pat Finucane five months later. Yeah, well, obviously at the time, at the time whenever whenever it happened, I mean, I mean, it was being put up about it that it was just a, a random, random sectarian killing. It wasn't. It was, it was far from a random sectarian killing. But we found out, um, obviously, Burnham and I was only nine, so I didn't probably didn't find all this information out. I was obviously 15, 16 whenever I started, obviously reading things and different things. Um, we found out that. Um, the force research unit obviously they had passed on intelligence the likes of with Brian Nelson um, they knew up to two weeks in advance that my dad was being targeted and um, Brian Nelson obviously got the information and um, it was all from, from what I'm led to believe was why it happened was it was a guy um, a UDA or UDF man whatever it was a guy called Billy Quee he was he was murdered I think it was on the it was on the Hill Park Road in Belf North Belfast, and they wanted revenge for, for Billy Quee's um, murder. So Brian Nelson um, went and got went and got photographs of of people from within West Belfast, the Clannard area, and showed them to apparently um, two witnesses, people that was in the shop when Billy Quee was was assassinated. Um, and apparently they picked out my father. And that's, that was the reason why he was targeted, which has since been proved that my daddy was completely innocent. He, he wasn't. He wasn't in any terrorist organization. And so it was just, it was, it was an easy target, basically, because where we lived, we lived right beside Larnock Way in, in Clannard, right, very, very close to the peace line. I mean, uh, we lived directly, directly facing Clannard Monastery. So it was easy access for them to come in and out. I mean, from what we're led to believe was obviously they were made sure that they had an easy access. I mean, Brian Nelson with his handlers with the RUC and with MI5, they got a clear passage there right. and back out again. Brian Nelson was a British Army agent. He yes. was a former British Army trooper, British became a British Army agent, worked and with a force he, research unit, which was he supposed was also, to handle. He was also, also the UDA's chief, chief intelligence officer. Right. And he was supposed to report to the people who paid him, the British Army, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the Force Research Unit. What information did they give to your family to warn you, warn your father that this killing was going to happen? No, and no. how were these people still then allowed roaming free to murder Pat Finucane five months later, as well as so many others? That's that's the answers that we need, Martin. Um, at the end, we didn't get any any indication whatsoever. There wasn't even as much as a knock on the door from the RUC or to invite my daddy into, into the police station to say, to say that his life was under threat. There was, there was nothing. The first, the, the first thing we knew was the time when they came through our front door with, with two sledgehammers. That's, that's the first And the information that we found out through, obviously, through the Southern Report um, was they knew, obviously, they, they knew the information. Brian Nelson had passed the information on his handlers and the RUC uh, special bonds, they knew it was going to happen, but they decided that they weren't going to do anything about it. And then, obviously, I think whenever my dad, from trying to remember, you have to bear me. I mean, I've obviously, with all this going on, I, over the years, my way of dealing with this is, is just blocking it out, putting it to the back of my mind, forgetting about it. So I, whenever the Stevens Quarry came out, whenever the Silver Report came out, I didn't read it. Because um, it just brought up too many memories, and as I say, it just it had, it had a, that was my my coping mechanism was just put it in the back of my head, block it all, like forget about it. All right, but, Sean, Sean, um, your family fought for justice, you know, to get yeah. the answers why a British agent was allowed to target your father, get away with it. The same loyalist gang were able to kill others, including Pat Finucane and others. Yeah, 
you've gotten the attorney general ruled that you're entitled to an inquest. And now that inquest may be taken away if this Northern Ireland Troubles uh, legacy and reconciliation bill goes through. Uh, What would that mean to you and your family? Well, at the end, we, we, need, we need this inquest to happen. Um, it would be devastating, absolutely devastating. We, we need it to happen. My mum has been fighting this case with, with, um, with Mark and Relatives for Justice and, her, and KRW Law, Paul Pierce. They, they've been fighting it for years. Um, for this, we've got this far. For it to close it down now, it would, it would kill her. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the only way, we, the only way that we're actually going to get full closure is to find out exactly what happened to my dad, who was involved, we want a hope, no chance, party, just accountability. We need. We know that there's there's people still out there that were involved in his murder. At the end of the day, they, they need to answer for it. They need to answer for it. All right. Thank you, Sean. We're now going to go to a second victim's family member, Caitlin Hughes, and her uncle, Gavin McShane, was a victim, and he actually began. We called him a miracle baby because he narrowly survived being an assassination just before he was born and later as a college student then would be shot and killed. Um, we have his niece here, Caitlin Hughes. <laughs> Caitlin, could you tell us why uh, Gavin was called a miracle baby? Could you tell us what happened to your grandmother uh, when she was carrying Gavin uh, that led you to describe him in that way? Uh, yeah, Gavin was known as the miracle baby because My uh, grandmother, Maria McShane, was injured in a bomb explosion in the step-in bar in Katie in County Armagh back in uh, 1976. Um, There was two people died in the explosion, which was uh, George McLean and Betty MacDonald. My nanny was actually pregnant with Gavin at the time. Uh, Thankfully, he was all right, but... um, my nanny was badly injured, losing her left eye and uh, sustaining severe head injuries. Um, the two people that planted the bomb were actually uh, serving members of the RUC. Are those, there were also members of what's called the Glenan Gang. Uh, John Weir and uh, McCaughey was the other one. They were serving members of the RUC. There supposedly the Glen Ann gang was involved uh, in the Dublin Monaghan bombings. It was involved in the Miami show band massacre, which we've heard about. They've been involved in, they're said to be 120 to 130 killings. And how was it that they were able to go in into Katie and, and do this serving members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary? Um, well, they were members of the RUC and the British army and, um, and as you said, they were part of the um, loyalist murder gang known as the Glenan Gang. Um, they were led by um, the sectarian killer who's known as uh, Robin Jackson. He was a British soldier, but he's also known as the Jackal. It was document- It has been documented that, the Jack- or that Jackson was um, a British agent and the leader of the Mid-Ulster UVF and the Glenan Gang. All right. And John Weir, one of the people involved, actually gave an interview to the Irish News a few years ago where he said that this was well known. What they were doing was known throughout the British military and RUC. And in his words, it went right to the top, meaning to the British Parliament. All right. Now, 17 years later, Gavin's a miracle baby. He surprised. He survives this um, bombing, um, which your grandmother was so badly injured. What happened to him 17 years later while he was a college student? So on the 18th of May, back in um, 1994, Gavin and his friend Shane, during a morning uh, break at school where they were studying, um, they went to a local taxi office in the county or in Armagh city centre um, as the taxi office was full of students who was playing a video game. Um, a lot of the students left because they had to go back to class but Gavin and Shane decided to stay on and play the video game. This is when an unmasked gunman walked across the road into the, de- into the depot 
and shot Gavin and Shane. Um, Shane died the next day due to his injuries, but Gavin died instantly. They were just both innocent schoolboys that were just there at the wrong time. Right, now, you know the name of the person who went in and fired the shots. You were able to tell me that name. Your family knows the name. And he was able to walk in, kill these two young men and walk out. And there was no problem. How is it that somebody who's well known is involved in a killing like this uh, just in the middle of the town? How is it that somebody like this could get away with that and walk around unmasked to commit these murders? Um, he's a British MI5 agent and he's protected still to this day. He's never got a parking ticket. He only lives 30 minutes away from our hometown, um, walks around free, still protected to this day. Um, I just don't understand how that's possible um, after killing so many people. He was supposed to be involved in up to 30 killings. Is that correct? Yes. um, Mostly young people um, and elderly people as well. Um, But I don't, he hasn't been um, committed for any of the crimes that he done. All right. So this, his name is known. It's widely known by people in the area. He was recognized uh, on the day of your brother's kill, of your, sorry, your uncle's killing. And yet he can still go around to this day never to have been arrested. Your family has sued uh, the Royal Ulster Constabulary to try and get some kind of answers, push why this man was never arrested, what their role was in the killing. What would it mean to you if this new law is passed and that suit, that last opportunity you have for truth is taken away? Um. It would be it would be very disheartening after fighting for so many years, especially going down the generations like my nanny fought for decades and then it was passed on to my mummy and my uncle. And now I started helping them. Um, I just think it would only be fair if all the victims got justice for all the heartache that they've been put through. And if the bill of shame comes in, um, I think it would it would be very unfair to some families. Um, that's why we call on people in the US to help stop the legacy bill, the bill of shame. Okay, and obviously you're a college student now yourself. You were not around when this happened to your uncle, but this is just something that you steal deeply, obviously very deeply and emotionally about a family tragedy like this and the fact that you've gotten no justice for it. If that be and you're, you're, that's why you're here with us fighting for justice today. So we want to thank you. We're now going to go to Ireland. We have a number of developments. There are some important elected officials who are on with us. They're going to talk about different developments that are being done right now to fight this bill. And we're going to begin with Fergus O'Dowd. He's in, I hope he's back. He, I know he was in another event, but he's a TD from County Louth. And he is also the chair of a very important committee in Oroctus Committee, the Good Friday Implementation Committee. And Fergus, just, we should start by telling us what is the Good Friday Implementation Committee? Well, basically when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, uh, our parliament in the South, which governs the 26 counties, established what's called an all-party committee, of which there are 16 members uh, made up of all the different political parties and independents in the Oireachtas, uh, to look at the issues around its implementation, issues of concern. And obviously we get involved with uh, North-South cooperation issues. We get involved with meeting people like Conor Burns, the former Northern Ireland Minister of State. <clears throat> We've been to America. Um, I know Rose Conway Walsh is with me and she was with us um, when we met with high officials in the department. And indeed, Martin, we met yourself. We met significant leaders in your political system. So basically, we're there to support this implementation, to meet people who have concerns, to articulate those concerns and to bring about, obviously, peace and reconciliation in our island. The, the unique thing about our committee is that there are 18 members of parliament in the north who are elected to go uh, to Westminster. And all of those 18 have a right to, to speak and attend our meeting. And of those 18, 10 actual, 10 MPs, 
uh, attend our meetings either by Zoom or in person, but whichever is the most appropriate for them. And we have very good participation. Uh, so the other thing I want to say, Martin, if I may, uh, to thank you for all your help and particularly also uh, Danny O'Connell, who facilitated very high level meetings between us, our committee and uh, your American politicians of all parties. So we're very active. We meet weekly. We make decisions by consensus. We don't divide on issues, but clearly promoting reconciliation, upholding the rule of law, acknowledging and uh, trying to ensure that the suffering of victims and their survivors like Sean and Caitlin there, uh, you know, that they, their, their needs can be met even after all this period of time. Fergus, so uh, sorry, just sorry to cut across you. Um, one of the things your committee did, and I should mention, you're, you are with the Fine Gael party, but your committee represents all of the parties or all the major parties in the 26 counties, as well as the people that you bring over from other political parties in the north. The, uh, the SDLP, yes, yeah. short same yeah. would be on both sides, Labor, Fianna Fáil, et cetera. One of the things that's very important, uh, you had actually sent me uh, after our meetings when you were visiting the United States, you had indicated at that time that you were gonna raise with the committee a letter to the Attorney General recommending that they look into not forcing families like these, if they're gonna begin a series of lawsuits to get to the European Parliament to try and bring Britain in directly, that you would recommend that the Irish government take this case on their behalf, fight for justice for them. Could you tell us what happened with that recommendation? Well, basically, the committee agreed unanimously. Um, we've been in communication with the Attorney General. Now, he has acknowledged that, as you're aware, it was June, July, August, uh, during the holiday period. So we would expect to have a full reply from the AG shortly. Uh, but obviously, clearly, if, if the legislation changes, and we've been told by some people uh, in, in the United Kingdom Parliament that it may change, but we will continue to pressurize for full accountability uh, for the upholding in full and in every way the rule of law and anybody whether it's British Army, IRA, UVF, whoever it is, anybody who committed foul and evil deeds uh, and murders most awful uh, that they should face the law and that's that's our job. And uh, we'll continue to press that, Martin. And that's exactly what would happen under the Storm and House Agreement. All killings would be investigated. I think yes. we have that letter. I think it's very important. I want to commend you and the other members of the committee. And uh, uh, we also want to thank you for mentioning that this happened after a meeting or corresponding with the AOH. And very much. you then indicated your committee on behalf of that cross-party committee, recommended to the Attorney General, you called on them to examine the Northern Ireland Troubles legacy view with a view towards taking interstate uh, litigation if it contravenes the Articles 2 and 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So Fergus, one, we think this is a very important development. It's a very important development that you and the committee have put forward to support families like uh, Sean, like that of uh, Caitlin, and we applaud you for this very important political development, and we're looking to work with you in supporting the intervention like this, making sure that Good Friday works for victims and that these people get justice. Thank Absolutely, you, Martin. Martin, and thank you for all your work. And could I just mention for your American listeners that my brother Neil O'Dowd would be a good friend of yours, and Kieran Staunton, my brother-in-law, that we've, my family have always been involved in trying to bring peace and reconciliation on our island. I was going to mention that. I, I tell everybody that you're Niall O'Dowd's better looking brother. And, uh, but, you, okay. Uh, <laughs> but you can it for him. Martin, let me just interject. Uh, Karen Staunton is on, Fergus. So uh, you did a good oh, job. Good stuff. So Karen's on watch. And thank you for joining us, Karen. He's a bit, Karen's been a big supporter of the AOH and has really helped us in so many areas, especially immigration. So thank you for all your family does. Okay, the legislation is in the House of Lords. So we're next going to go to a representative from the British House of Lords. Uh, 
Nula Olone, now a baroness who sits in the House of Lords, and she was a former ombudsman. So she has been involved in investigating legacy cases through the police ombudsman uh, office uh, before becoming obviously a baroness. And uh, Nula, we'd like to, first of all, because we have a new British prime minister, because we have a new British secretary for the north of Ireland, what do you think the attitude of the new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, and a new appointee to be British Secretary for the North of Ireland? They're described as, as people who would be supportive of the European Research Group within the Conservative Party. What do you think that that new administration, that that new appointment, how did that fare for, for Ireland? Well, I think there are two issues in what you've just said. One is the Brexit issue, which we'll just park, I think, for the purposes of today. But the other is this bill about which we're speaking today. We have had no indication whatsoever that uh, government proposes to change the legacy bill. And the legacy bill is completely broken. I've been in touch with the Secretary of State, the previous Secretary of State, the new one's just appointed. I've been in touch with NIO officials. I have tried. We've had there are a lot of meetings, but we've had no real indication of intention to change. We've had a lot of words. We've had letters back that say, you know, we're open to amendments and things like that. But at the moment, I, I see no sign that government are giving the important things that they need to give on this bill. To give you one simple example, this bill provides there will be no inquests, there will be no prosecutions in the normal way, and there will be no right of victims to bring civil actions for the damage and loss and harm they've suffered. Um, without those three things, victims' rights in law are denied. So the general consensus in Northern Ireland and in the United Kingdom, because this bill applies right across the United Kingdom, applies to anybody who was injured in Birmingham or Manchester or Hyde Park or anywhere. Um, they will have their civil rights, their legal rights taken away from them. And that is not compliant with our international legal obligations. We have an obligation to provide Article 2 compliant investigations. One of the things that concerns us, we had representatives of victims, families who were involved, uh, their family members being killed, were involved in Operation Achille and Operation Greenwich, they were two ombudsman reports. And those are exactly the type of thing that you used to do in the north of Ireland. And those victims came on, they said that they had gotten a measure of truth, they had gotten a measure of justice, at least from those investigations, they were gratified by that. You no, know, Mark was very much involved with those families. And now that too is going to be taken away. Why do you think when these things come out, when they pay off, they bring truth, that they're now being taken away by this new legislation? The government made a commitment in their manifesto before they were elected that they would provide immunity for veterans. And that's what this bill is all about. It's providing immunity for veterans. In that process, it will also provide immunity for Republican and loyalist um, paramilitaries. Uh, but it will provide, if people seek it, it will provide amnesty for them from prosecution if they tell such story as they choose to tell. They're supposed to tell the full story, but there's no process which would make them tell the full story. So governments seem to get hooked on this thing that they needed to protect veterans from what they call vexatious prosecutions. But there haven't been any vexatious prosecutions. There have been very few prosecutions. I sit now, I'm no longer police ombudsman, but I sit on the um, international steering group for Operation Canova, which is investig which is reviewing the Glenarm killings about which we've just spoken, but which is also investigating the uh, British agent known as State Knife, who uh, worked with the British government as a state agent for many years, and and all the murders and other atrocities which resulted from that relationship. So what I've seen repeatedly is this pattern of agents from um, the Republican community and the loyalist community working with the British government over long periods of years and the, their activities being protected. What happened I think was that the agents became more important to their handlers than the prevention of crime. And, and then we see the terrible terrible situations like Sean has just described to us and I would want to to express my sympathy to both of them to both of our victims because they have suffered a terrible terrible 
two, two points just on what you've just said. For example, you have one person prosecuted for 13 murders and so many woundings on Bloody Sunday. You have no one prosecuted for Bally Murphy. You, and yet all of this, that one person, that seems to be too much for the British government to bear. They have to close it down. The second thing is the point that Fergus made under the agreement that the Irish government made, the Storm and House Agreement. Historical investigations would have applied across the board to everyone. You would investigate killings by the IRA. You investigate killings by loyalists. You can investigate killings by the British Army, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the Ulster Defense Regiment. And all of the political parties in the north of Ireland oppose this bill. They support that Storm and House agreement going forward, with a limited exception, perhaps, to the official unionists. And it's only the British government that says, no, we can't have this. We can't have these investigations, even though they would be very much involved in setting that up. I'd like to ask you, what can be done in the House of Lords? What are, I know you've gotten a very important letter that was signed by 30 congressmen. It was spearheaded by Congressman Keating. And that followed a briefing that we had uh, in July. Uh, it was actually as the AOH convention opened up by Congressman Keating. You've just responded to that. What can be done in the British House of Lords, if anything, to slow this bill down, to stop it from getting to the point where the Irish government has to bring an action in the European court? The, um, the bill has to go through a series of stages in the House of Lords. That first stage was to have been on Tuesday. We were supposed to be first debating the bill on Tuesday, but since the Queen has died, Parliament's uh, in, in no longer sitting. So I think it'll be a month before we sit down to it. So, so we'll have a, a debate, a general debate about the merits of the bill. And it has to be said that it's not just everybody in Northern Ireland who's opposed to this bill. An awful lot of people in the rest of the United Kingdom are. The United Nations have expressed their condemnation. The Council of Europe have expressed their condemnation. The uh, Chief Commissioner for Human Rights has expressed her condemnation. So when we get to the next stage, which is committee stage, which I think will probably happen mid-November, we will take the bill apart, clause by clause, and point out where it is not compliant with our international obligations, where although governments say they're setting up an investigation process within the bill, because government keeps saying, of course there are going to be investigations. You know, this new commissioner will carry out the investigations, but it's all circumscribed in such a way that there will be very few investigations. And if you look at simple things like we will tell the world that, for example, if if, that, if the commissioner wants to get access to sensitive material, you know, um, intelligence material and stuff like that, they have to make requests for it. I had to make those requests, but I had a right to the material. The commission doesn't have a right to the material and the secretary of state can decide it's not going to be released. So that's one. The second thing you have is you have the amnesty provisions where somebody can, who's in the frame for a crime can, can uh, say, well, actually I'll turn, evidence, I'll give you evidence, in return for which I get no prosecution. And nothing that's disclosed in that um, amnesty application can be used for a prosecution. So although they've provided for prosecutions, they've chipped away at the way in which you do prosecutions and the things you need to bring a prosecution. So we, we will take all those things into the House, we will talk about them, we will argue about them. We are facing a huge difficulty because there are so many government members of the House of Commons, and whatever changes we make, the House of Commons have to approve them. So I think the important thing now is that internationally, the voice is, is heard telling Liz Truss that this bill must be withdrawn. Last week, the British government, the new prime minister withdrew uh, a Bill of Rights bill, which was going to change and I think diminish our Bill of our Rights under law. This one needs to go to, this is not a viable bill. Chief Commissioner for Human Rights said it was broken, it couldn't be fixed. But all we can do in the House of Lords is try to fix it, but it will be profoundly difficult. In the past, as police ombudsman, I had huge support from America and Ireland in the work that I did. I would ask for that support again, in every possible way, to help us to defeat this bill. This bill does not care for victims, and this bill will not bring reconciliation. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Baroness Alone. We're next going to go to County Mayo and to another member of the implementation, Good Friday, 
committee uh, agreement implementation committee, Rose uh, Conway Walsh and uh, Rose, you represent or you are a TD representing Mayo, member of Sinn Fein. Uh, Fergus, of course, if I didn't mention it, is with Fina Gale. So this shows that the breadth of parties across Ireland who were interested. And you had an opportunity, you were at a special conference uh, recently, and you had an opportunity to raise a question with Michal Martin, the Taoiseach about going forward, bringing a suit, bringing an action to take Britain to court if this bill goes through. Could you tell us about what happened? Thank you very much, Martin. And maybe first to explain what the, the British Irish Association is. Each year, members from Britain and Ireland, members of Parliament, um, judiciary, and uh, a lot of people from the, the world of academia gather together to discuss under Chatham House rules how we might progress things. And Fergus was there as well. So Fergus can concur with me on some of that. So the question I put, because there's absolutely, and I think Baroness alone put it very succinctly in terms of the loss of faith. The question I put is, we need to be ready for uh, presenting this to Europe for, for, for going down. What pathways was the Irish government looking at to challenge this bill through the ECHR if it's not withdrawn before then? Now, what the Taoiseach said was that obviously because there's a new prime minister, a new secretary of state, that the Irish government wanted to give an opportunity to the British to act in good faith to withdraw the bill completely. Now, I can understand that as well. So he didn't outline what the preparations were done, were done, but I think that that will progress if it's not withdrawn in the next number of months for, um, for, for the Irish state to take an interstate uh, case uh, to Europe against the British government for the reasons that Nula uh, um, out, outlined there in terms of the breaches of the international human rights obligations and particularly around Article 2. Now, this would be a similar action, Martin, to the action that was taken on behalf of the hooded men uh, back in, in the early 1970s. Now, the legislative uh, process would have to be completed and, it would, and the bill would have had to receive royal assent before a legal challenge could be bought. Uh, it, but if the bill is not halted before it's concluded. Now, obviously, it would have to go through the domestic courts as well, including the British Supreme Court. And it's interesting what the European Council were saying in relation to that, because across the board, as Baroness uh, Olo said, all of the opinions on this, whether it be um, Amnesty International, um, the model bill team, who I want to acknowledge, did a very good analysis of it, um, all agreed that it is non-compliant. You know, the Commissioner for Human Rights concluded that it runs a very significant risk of being found uh, non-compliant by, by the domestic courts and indeed by the ECHR. So the government are trying to avoid, if possible, um, the, the having to do that, having to drag it through the courts and, and, and deal with it that way. So this is a political decision. It's an absolute political decision in the first instance uh, to bring this bill forward. And again, as Baroness Olone said, it is in response to um, the, it, it's a Tory party political choice to place the demands of the military lobby uh, above the needs of the victims. That's what it is. And the only thing that will move this, I believe, is um, political pressure. And that's why I do want to thank you for organizing today and Danny for organ AOH for organizing today. We, time is running out for us and we need all of the political pressure that we can get. Okay, again. I just, just want to clarify, if this bill, well, if it is passed and is taken to the European court, hmm. the Irish government could bring one directly to yes. just do to what you described as go through domestic courts, what that would hmm. mean for these families like the, like Caitlin Hughes, like Sean Slain, all of the other families fighting for justice. They have to start at the lowest level within British courts. You then go to appellate courts. You have to go all the way up. You'd have to go through the Supreme Court in London. You're mm -hmm. talking about five years of actions to go mm -hmm. forward before mm -hmm. you'd simply get to the state, the, the, the place where the Irish government could bring it directly. Mm -hmm. um, that's why this action, this proposal is so important. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you, um, you were just in the United States along with Fergus. You met along with Fergus and other members of the committee with American political officials. How important do you think um, the support of people like Congressman Keating, like Senator Schumer, 
like uh, Congressman Neal, the others who have been on board on this issue, uh, Congressman Kelly, to name a, a Republican, how important is that support to you? And again, the AOH is one of the groups which tries to generate that, stay with them and try to bring that support forward. How important do you think is that to what you're trying to do? I couldn't overestimate the importance of that. And it was discussed in Oxford last weekend as well in terms of the US administration. But we need, I think we need to, we need to up the pressure, if you like. Now, I welcome what um, um, President Biden um, uh, said uh, during the week, um, uh, what he said in terms of protecting the Good Friday Agreement in his conversation with Liz Truss. But I, I'm fearful that because there's the two bills there that are really important, the protocol bill and that bill, the, the amnesty bill that they, the, uh, the, um, that the, that bill, is the legacy bill is being... Um, not taken second place, but because they're two cru crucial pieces of legislation. Um, I, I think that it, what needs to happen is that the US administration would come out and specifically um, um, talk about this bill and the implications of it, the international implications of it. I mean, um, uh, the, the implications for Scotland, for Wales. Um, a, a key theme of the Biden administration's foreign policy is to rally the world's democracies uh, in opposition to autocratic models of governance. Now, this bill is an absolute complete perfect example of autocratic model of government governance, giving whole powers uh, to the Secretary of State and, and, and driving a coach and horses through international agreements, whether it be the, the, the Good Friday Agreement and obviously Storm and House and New Decade, New Approach as well. So it's not just of concern to this island. It should be concerned worldwide. The message we are giving out from here is that it's OK to, to make agreements and to break them at will. And it's not okay. And we heard, and I want to acknowledge Sean and, uh, and, and Caitlin earlier on, they have waited decades for inquests, for something as very basic as an inquest. We all have an obligation to do that. So I think if there was one thing and one thing coming from today is, is we, we need that message to get across that we need the US administration to put the pressure directly on the British government to withdraw the bill based on the requirement for a trade deal with the US. I think they have some bargaining power there. Uh, to do that, and I would appeal um, that they that they do that. We will, as a Good Friday Agreement Committee, we'll be travelling to London as well shortly to discuss individually with MPs and with with members over there. I don't think this bill is, you know, some bills, Martin. You get you can put in amendments and they can make them okay. We do it all the time. This bill does not lend itself to amendments. It has to be withdrawn completely. A uh, term I th think the model team is using was uh, unredeemable or irredeemable. I'm not sure which is the correct word. Um, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that. That's one of the reasons why the AOH is stressing doing a webinar on legacy. We want to make sure that because of all the attention on the other serious issue with the protocol, that this issue cannot be lost, cannot mm -hmm. um, uh, be overlooked. And I also, I see Ed Halligan there. I want to mention uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick on the Republican congressman, who's a leader for us on congressional issues. I don't want to leave him out. Uh, Danny, uh, Baroness alone has a, has a hand up or something. I do. Is there a question that you want to ask at this time? No, I just wanted to say that, that um, Rose is right. We can't, the bill is irredeemable. The bill is unfixable. But we actually have to try and fix it because we have no choice because it's coming into the House and because the government have the numbers <clears throat> to force it through Parliament. And that's why it's so important that any effort or any lever which can be used to stop it and to ensure that it's withdrawn is withdrawn. So thank you for the opportunity to say that. There you go. Um... Mark, we um, have Mark Thompson on who helped to organize this. I'm sure, well, I don't know if the bill is redeemable at all. Maybe if you had a statute of limitations that everything doesn't come into place for another 10 years or uh, 
something like that or it involves would bring back the historical investigations unit. That might be it, but it doesn't look like the conservative government, the Liz Trust government, the government uh, given by a recommendation of a new so secretary is going to tolerate any amendments. Mark, I uh, want to thank you for bringing most of the people together with us. And I know you have something to say and add because you're such a leader on the issue of legacy. Well, I, I first want to commend Sean and Caitlin and, and particularly for speaking about quite difficult, emotional um, uh, and pressing issues. I think it gives a sense of where we're at as a society. Caitlin wasn't even born when her uncle Gavin was killed and it, she's picking up the mantle of, of a new generation. This issue will not go away and it will be challenged. And Sean, as a nine-year-old um, child, having to experience what he experienced, families aren't giving up. It isn't going to go away. This will be challenged. We're involved with the challenge around it being unconstitutional at the Supreme Court, and we'll see how it plays out. But essentially, we had a backdrop of conflict, and, 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 and it's refreshing to hear Nula talk about the administration of justice and rule of law and her right to get access to documents. She's right about this bill. It vests too much power in a British Secretary of State that can arbitrarily decide who gets immunity and who doesn't, who gets amnesty, who doesn't, and what will be revealed and what won't. It's carte blanche to kind of rewrite the rules and everything. One of the things that happened to the backdrop of conflict for all victims and survivors was that with the Good Friday Agreement, and not least with the pressure of America in brokering the Good Friday Agreement, we got rights and entitlements. We got the European Convention of Human Rights through the Human Rights Act 1998 brought into the lo local domestic legislature, and that gave families agency, agency from the first time to pursue matters. And we got an ombudsman's office then Nula was the first ombudsman with a retrospective remit to look at past violations by members of the police. And that proved to be successful in terms of uh, working. The courts were working. The European Convention was applied. And the new rules changed what had gone before, where policemen and soldiers would be made amenable before courts, would have to come to the inquest, would have to answer questions. Prosecutions would need to make a sufficient explanation as to why there wasn't prosecutions in certain cases where there prima facie evidence. Then we had the devolution of criminal justice and policing, and we had the appointment of an attorney general, and we petitioned that attorney general with fresh and compelling evidence to reopen and revisit inquests in many instances, and to refer cases to the public prosecutor. So it was a game changer in terms of providing a platform for rights in which families took center ground and sought to seek redress and remedy for the terrible violations that they had experienced at the backdrop of three and a half to four decades of armed conflict. And in the context of doing that, and in the context of what's happening, just to give a landscape picture, there are currently 450 cases with the police ombudsman that constitutes around 500 deaths that have met the grave and exceptional threshold that warrant investigation. There are currently around 1,100 civil cases in the local courts in which there's been allegations of misfeasance in public office uh, through to collusion, through to torture. There are around 1,400 cases unsolved that sits in the caseload of the LIB, the Legacy Investigation Branch of the PSNI, they are in cold storage. And we have an agreement Stormont House that the British government signed up to that's human rights compliant, to which now they've reneged on. And in that landscape, they have looked at that broader picture and they have said, we don't like what we see. And we have a, a backdrop to see what's been going on, whether it's the Dublin Monaghan bombings, whether it's, you know, the Glen Ann gang, whether it's the force research, you know, of what Sean has experienced, or whether it's any act of the conflict from all sides and all sides have signed up their process. And what they have looked at that broader canvas and said, we don't like what we see. And the only way that we're getting out of this is to, to, to kind of give some sort of, give, give an amnesty. And Nula's right in terms of probably the context of a lobby by veterans, but it's much broader because the resistance that families have felt in courts we have had the use of public interest immunity certificates on disclosure and discovery matters in civil cases. We have had the stalling tactics of failing to properly fund sufficiently the police ombudsman when it independently does its job. So they pull the kind of the life support in terms of resource to enable it. It's going at a snail's pace. Then we have the kind of the, the, the case that we were involved in when there was clearly collusion between Arlene Foster and the NIO in preventing 
David Ford, the Justice Minister, from providing the Lord Chief Justice with the resources to do the five-year plan, the whole legacy inquest. We had to go to court and not with the High Court in Belfast found that the actions of Arling Foster were for improper political motivation and were, were, were unlawful. So then we get that replaced. And then what we find, there's a snail's place by the retired officers that don't come forward and advocate that former officers shouldn't cooperate with either the ombudsman or the inquests. We have all of these issues and we have all of these national security issues. And then we have the use of closed, the use of closed material procedures, which are secret courts. And this battle has played itself out when families took agency from the Good Friday Agreement right until we got to the point of the Stormont House Agreement. And then the British government realized, oh, that's not going to be very good for us. All of our people are vulnerable now. All of our policies and practices are vulnerable. We have to find a way to stop this. And this amnesty builds their way to do that. It's undemocratic, it's unconstitutional, it's unlawful. And when we come out of conflict, instead of building the institutions of democracy, the rule of law and the administration of justice, this Tory administration are doing the very opposite. And that spells bad news for moving forward in terms of trying to create and build upon the building blocks that we have with the Good Friday Agreement. It completely undermines the Good Friday Agreement. All right, uh, Danny, before I turn it back to you, I just want to acknowledge and thank there are a number of different groups which are uh, supporting this webinar, supporting the AOH, uh, having this webinar. I know the Brehan sent it out to all their members. I know the Irish American Unity Conference did the same. Um, Dolores Desch, the Ladies AOH, the 1916 Societies in Rhode Island, all of them are behind us. They'll all have representatives. They'll be watching this either live or they'll watch it on YouTube. And we appreciate the fact that this is a joint effort. It's all of us together can get behind people like Brendan Boyle or Congressman Keating or all of the other congressmen, Congressman Neil Fitzpatrick, Kelly, all of the other congressmen who can push forward, push the Biden administration, push forward with the congressional support that we need to do something about this bill. Danny? Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, another great job. Um, uh, together with me and Sean and Ed are about another dozen or so Hibernians and ladies Hibernians here in uh, South Bend. And we're all uh, watching with great interest. Uh, we learned a lot. Before we um, conclude, I want to give our national vice president, Sean Pender, an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Martin, for uh, putting this on. Uh, I commend everyone uh, on this today, and uh, especially uh, Sean and and uh, and, and Caitlin. Um, you know, uh, Fergus and, and Rose, your 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 words uh, were tremendous, and I'm sure very comforting for the uh, to, for the families. But I, I, I commend your dedication to this and uh, meeting you in in, uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, we look forward to bringing that that pressure uh, pressure uh, on. And, and I had the great honor of meeting with uh, Baroness Alone. Uh, back in 2007, shortly after uh, uh, Ballast, uh, Operation Ballast was, was, um, was released. And, and basically that report established collusion between certain officers within Special Branch and a UVF in North Belfast and other places. That was 15 years ago. Shortly thereafter, working with Mike Glass and with Mark Thompson, uh, we were able to bring uh, the first cross-community um, group to briefing. And Sean, your mother, was on that. Um, briefing. Um, I'm just looking through my notes here and it's amazing. We actually were in Washington, D.C. on March 13th in 2007 with uh, uh, Mark and Raymond McCord, Paul McElween, uh, Pauline Davey, and, and of course, Teresa Slane. Um, that's 15 years ago. 15 years ago, the work of, uh, of such a brave woman in Baroness alone, and nothing has been done uh, since then, when you think about it. Uh, that should have been the beginning of where the British government said we need to get to the bottom of this, but instead of it, they decided to, uh, you know, uh, not address the truth, not address uh, justice, and they best, basically they, they want to cover it up. So it's great to hear the uh, passionate voices up here, and we continue to do everything we can to say, you know, the protocol is very important, but legacy is just as, as important, uh, and we will continue to do everything we can uh, to, to stop this, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, something from our, from our government, but uh, we will advocate for Caitlin, for Sean, and, and sadly, too many more families to get the truth that they so justly deserve. And, and I thank uh, all of It's great to see such a partisan approach from all such cross-community um, uh, people on both sides of the community in Ireland, and also to all the political parties on the island of Ireland, and 
in fact, on, in, the, in Britain. So our work will continue, uh, and, but thank you all for all your, uh, your efforts and support. Uh, thank you, Sean, and, and thank all of our um, attendees today. And uh, we're very excited that we're going to get this out, and we're going we're gonna to have uh, thousands of people view this around the country, and it's going to help us to continue. I think one of the things we all need to remember is that on uh, March 17th, the United States Congressman or Congress unanimously signed a letter saying that the, uh, this bill should be stopped. Um, every Republican, every Democrat voted to stop this bill. I know the, um, the United Kingdom is looking for a partnership with the United States. The United States is looking for a partnership with the United Kingdom. But we've said loud and clear, if you can't honor the agreements you've made, why would we enter a new agreement? At this time, um, we're going to start with our guests, uh, Sean and then Caitlin, for a closing comment. And then we're going to ask each of our other guests um, for a quick closing comment. And we're going to wrap up. And as Sean said, the importance of this bill really, really hits you when you see the level of guests that we're able to bring on these events, and um, including U.S. Congressman uh, uh, Martin uh, mentioned a few. Uh, we have a few members of the Ancient Order Hibernians in the United States Congress, and they've been very vocal. Um, Brennan Boyle, for example, who we all know. Uh, Martin's mentioned uh, uh, a couple already. And at this time, we'll move to Sean, followed by Caitlin. If you'll unmute Caitlin. Go ahead, Sean. Thanks, Danny. Um I just want to thank you all for, for the opportunities to speak today. As I said earlier, it's not that often that I speak about it. Um, I want to especially thank, thank Mark and Relatives for Justice for the support that they've given us for the last 30-odd 30, 30 years. Um, we, would, we wouldn't have got to where we are today without their support and the support, obviously, of, of our uh, lawyer, uh, Paul Pierce at KRW Law. I just want to show you a quick picture. Um, I don't know if you can see that. That's my father there. That's my sister Katrina. She was just coming three when this happened. That's himself. I was nine. That's my youngest brother, Jared. He was only nine months when this happened. That was our last Christmas together. That was the Christmas before it happened. Um, and as I say, we need accountability. We need justice. And thank just thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing that. I know it's very emotional, uh, Sean. We appreciate it. Caitlin? Um, the same as Sean, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to put our stories across. Um, such a great um, opportunity to speak to people across the water about the situation. And again, a massive thank you to Mark and everybody from Aldous for Justice. And the same as Sean, I'm just going to show a wee picture. This is actually my nanny in the White House meeting. Um, President Clinton and uh, the First Lady um, as well. Yeah, um, and then this is a picture of my Uncle Gavin then. Um, you, like a year beforehand. Um, but just thank you for everything. Thank you, Caitlin. And, and it's so important, the success of, I think all of our work has been based on families willing to come out and to speak with us. And I'm going to segue right into Mark, and then we'll go through our legislators, as uh, I think it's a good tie into the families. Mark? Um, listen, I'm not going to take up any more time. I, I, I just think what Sean and Caitlin have said is enough from Relatives for Justice, and it's their voice that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rose, uh, it's always a pleasure to see you and uh, speak with you. You've been so helpful since uh, before we met in Cleveland, Ohio, a few years back. But if you'll unmute and uh, give us your closing comments. Yeah, just to thank you and to Martin and everybody else. Um, and just to say to, to Caitlin and to Sean, you deserve accountability and justice. And we have to work collectively. This is cross, this is, this is, we are speaking with one voice across the island here, all political parties and beyond. Um, to, against this bill, to have this bill withdrawn, and we must continue to work together. But every day counts because time is of the essence, and uh, what we're doing has to support the work that I know Baroness alone will be trying, and others will be trying to do in the House of Lords as well. So we must continue. Thank you, Garmagat. Thank you, uh, Rose Baroness. 
Thank you. Um, government are, I think, going to try and push this through probably by about the end of January. So time is very, very short. Uh, Parliament is sovereign and it can do this no matter how hard we fight, it can do it. And then we're into a very, very difficult situation. Uh, if the bill is passed, the current review of the activities of the Glenarm gang, about which several people spoke today, will be lost unless special provision is made to keep that work. And I sit on the steering group for that with Americans. Um, that is a very, very important review of what happened. We mustn't lose what we've already achieved and the bill has to be withdrawn. So I can only thank you all very much for all you're doing. And, and in the name of all the other victims, ask you carry on and persuade the government, withdraw the bill. That's the only thing that will really work. I can assure you we will carry on. Uh, we've uh, fought this battle here. We fought this battle in um, Ireland. We've fought it in the North Ireland and we're gonna fight it in London until we're done. Uh, Fergus O'Dowd, uh, chairman of the uh, committee that's been so helpful with us. Sure, thank you very much, Danny, and to Sean as well, and to Martin. I can just say that listening to Caitlin and Sean there, like, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's still a very awful tragedy and you can't get closure uh, until, you know, people are held accountable and any delay, further delays, because those people are obviously getting older as well, uh, you know, makes it much worse for you. I want to say to Baroness alone that um, we'd be more than happy to meet with you. And if you'd like to come on our committee, I think Rose and myself would love to have your, the, you. you know, the, you've been a, a fantastic public servant who served everybody in the North in the past. And we would like to hear your voice as well. I just want to say one thing, like one of, I live in County Loud, there's been some appalling crimes in County Loud. One of them, which I think Nula may know about, is the, the murder of Tom Oliver is yes. under a and uh, it's a profoundly evil act that ended his life. And, you know, everybody wants closure, just like Sean and Caitlin and everybody else does. I just wonder if it's a hopeful point to make. Um, thanks to Martin on your access to the highest level in the United States. Uh, but when we met, and Rose was with me, when we met the uh, top officials in the State Department dealing with Ireland and the UK and so on, they gave us a very, a very good hearing. Uh, they listened to everything we said, and I believe they took it very much on board. And they did make us aware that people at the higher level in the department, and indeed the president of America himself, you know, is deeply concerned and committed to getting peace and reconciliation on our island. So I think while, you know, we have a lot to hope for, we have a lot of influence through, uh, through your movement in America. And I want to congratulate you on your presence in every state and your articulation and your energy. So thank you very much for having me on. And we look forward to meeting you both here in America again. And Nula will see you, please God, in the United, in, sorry, in the United Kingdom shortly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fergus. And, and it's so important that each of our guests here today get, were willing to give the time, um, their time. We, we know how valuable that is and it's greatly appreciated and, and our members appreciate it. But more importantly, we then can share your stories out to our local representatives and we will do that. Martin, anything else before we conclude? Just briefly, again, you just have put your finger on it. We have support. We can do what we do because of people like Caitlin, because of people like Sean, the victims who've come on, who've spoken, they inspire everyone. And that allows us, the members of the AOH across the country, together with the Irish American groups that work with us and support us, the Brehens, the Unity Conference, the Ladies AOH, everyone else. That's what gets us to Congress. That's what gets us to Senator Schumer or the other congressmen that we have. And that allows us to hold that strength together with people like Fergus, with people like Rose, with all of the people in the North of Ireland, with people like Baroness alone, who are gonna support us. And of course, we can do that, reach those victims because of people like Mark. So we got congressional letters in, we had a hearing in July, we had a letter in August, now we're again back on this. We've got to stop it. We've got to bring pressure. We count on everyone else to go forward. And before I end, just a commercial. Um, next week, we have a Gaelic mass, a mass said in Irish uh, at 2.30. It'll be shown on a webinar. And an added theme together with the mass rock theme, which we always use, is prayers for those who hunger and thirst for justice. 
like those people, Caitlin, like Sean and others that is going to be added. And lastly, there's a second webinar next week. Uh, you heard about Fenians who uh, joined the American army or fought in the American army, went back after the civil war and fought for Irish freedom. We're going to have one on uh, John Crawley next week. who's going to talk about the Yank, what it was like to be an American Marine who then used that experience to join the IRA and try uh, tried to bring that struggle to a successful conclusion in Ireland. So those who will be on, look for those. But again, thank you to everyone who came on and thank you for everyone who's watching and continues to be part of our support. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to all the legislators for the great work. And I think one of the things that's amazing about this is all over the world, um, the people who are, are looking at this, it's a nonpartisan issue. And, um, and that's what we are as the ancient order of Hibernians. We're a nonpartisan organization. That doesn't mean we're not political and we don't work on these issues. And this atrocity, and that's simply what it is, is seen around the world. And uh, I think the, um, the United Kingdom should stand up and take a look at it. And we had plans to be in London this week, the ancient order of Hibernians, and deliver re-deliver some of these uh, letters that we have, including the, um, the one from the unanimous resolution on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, that's a statement that needs to be seen. And uh, our thoughts and prayers are with the United Kingdom on the loss of the Queen. And, and I think uh, we've heard a lot of what she's done in the world in regard to justice and peace. And I think that's exactly what everyone here today is doing is working for justice and peace and so with respect we will not be meeting uh, in London next week but we will be there very soon and pick up where we left off working for justice and peace for all of Ireland and all the world thank you very much thank you